Horam. In accordance with the bargain struck with Horam, Iae was to be crowned pharaoh as soon as Tutankhamun's funeral obsequies were over. He therefore hastened the embalming and stopped further work on the tomb, which remained small and insignificant in comparison with those of the great pharaohs. By the same agreement he had engaged to coerce Princess Bakitaman into marriage with Horam, thus enabling Horam to prefer a lawful claim to the throne after Iai's death, despite his low birth. Iai had arranged with the priests that, after the period of mourning was over and Horam came to celebrate the festival of victory, Princess Bakitaman should appear before Horam in the guise of Sekhmet in Sekhmet's temple and there give herself to him that their union might be blessed by the gods and Horam himself become divine. Such was Iai's plan, but the princess, with much care and forethought, had made her own, in which I know Queen Nefertiti encouraged her. Queen Nefertiti hated Horam, and she hoped also to become next to Bakitaman, the most powerful woman in Egypt. So godless, so iniquitous was this plan that only the guile of a malignant woman could have conceived it. So incredible was it that it came near to succeeding. Only when this scheme became known could the magnanimity of the Hittites be accounted for, as shown in their offers of peace, their yielding of Megiddo and the land of Amuru, and in their other concessions. Since the death of Nefertiti's husband and her enforced submission to Ammon, the queen had been unable to endure the thought of being set aside from the throne and becoming of no more consequence than any other lady about the court. She was still beautiful, though her beauty now required meticulous care for its preservation. It won to her many of Egypt's nobles, who hung like drones about the court and its inconsiderable pharaoh. By her intelligence and guile she also won the friendship of Princess Bakitaman, whose innate haughtiness she fanned to a blaze until what had been pride became mania. The princess became so arrogant that she would not suffer the touch of any ordinary mortal nor even allow anyone to pass through her shadow. She had preserved her virginity in the belief that there was no man in Egypt worthy of her and was already past the normal age for marriage. Maidenhood had gone to her head, but I believe a good marriage might have cured her. Nefertiti persuaded Bakitaman that she was born to achieve great things and to liberate Egypt from the hands of lowborn usurpers. She spoke to her of the great queen Hatshepsut, who fastened a royal beard to her chin, girded herself with a lion's tail, and ruled Egypt from the throne of the pharaohs. She declared that Bakitaman's beauty resembled that of the great queen. She also spoke much evil of Horam so that the princess in her maidenly pride began to dread him as a man of low birth and as one who might possess her with a warrior's roughness and defile her sacred blood. Yet I believe she was secretly fascinated by his rough strength, she had looked on him overmuch and been inflamed by his glance, although she would never admit as much even to herself. Nefertiti had no difficulty in exerting her influence over the princess when, as the Syrian war drew to an end, Eiae's and Horam's plans became ever more evident. I do not fancy that Eiae attempted to conceal his purpose from his daughter Nefertiti. But she hated her father because, having made what use he could of her, he had thrust her aside and kept her hidden in the golden house because she was the widow of the accursed pharaoh. Beauty and intelligence united in a woman whose heart the years have hardened are dangerous qualities, more dangerous than knives unsheathed, more destructive than the copper sides of chariots. The best proof of this lies in the scheme Nefertiti contrived and in which she persuaded Princess Bakitaman to join. The plot came to light when Horam, having just arrived in Thebes, began in his impatience to loiter about the apartments of Princess Bakitaman in order to see and speak with her, although she refused to receive him. Chancing to see there a Hittite envoy who sought an audience of the princess, he wondered why she should receive such a man and give him so long an interview. Of his own accord, therefore, and without taking counsel of any, he arrested this Hittite, whose manner was haughty and who addressed him in terms only to be used by such as are sure of their authority. Horam then reported this to Eiai. At night they forced an entry into her rooms, slew the slaves who guarded her, and discovered certain correspondence she had hidden in the ashes of a brazier. Profoundly dismayed at the contents of these tablets, 
they imprisoned Bakitaman in her rooms and set a guard both on her and on Nefa. Tai Tai. That same night, they came to the copper founder's house, which Muti had had rebuilt with captor's silver. They came in an ordinary carrying chair, concealing their faces. Muti admitted them, muttering angrily when they ordered her to wake me. I was not asleep, ever since witnessing the horrors in Syria, I had slept badly. I rose from my couch while she was yet grumbling, and having lit lamps, I received these strangers in the belief that they required my help as a physician. When I saw who they were, I marveled, and when Muti at my order had brought in wine, I sent her back to bed. In his great fear Horam would have slain her because she had seen their faces and might hear their talk. Never had I seen Horam so frightened, and it gave me the greatest satisfaction. I said, I shall not permit you to slay Muti, you must be brain sick to talk so wildly. Muti is a deaf old hag who snores like a hippopotamus. If you will listen, you will soon hear her. Drink wine, therefore, and be assured that you need not tremble because of an old woman. Horam said impatiently, I have not come here to talk of snores, sinew. What is a life more or less when all Egypt is in mortal danger? It is Egypt you must save. Eie bore out his words, saying, Truly Egypt is in mortal danger, sinew, and I also. Never before has so great a peril menaced the land, in our distress we turn to you. I laughed bitterly and threw out empty hands. Horam brought out King. Shabaluliuma's clay tablets for me to read and also copies of the letters Princess Bakitaman had sent to him before the war ended. I read them and had no further desire to laugh, and the wine in my mouth lost its savor. Princess Bakitaman wrote thus. I am Pharaoh's daughter, and in my veins flows the sacred blood. There is in all Egypt no man worthy of me. I have heard that you have many sons. Send a son to me that I may break the jar with him, and he shall rule over the land of Kem at my side. So incredible was the tenor of this letter that the cautious Shabaluliuma would not believe it and by the hand of a secret envoy returned a suspicious inquiry as to terms. In a further letter Bakitaman repeated her offer, with the assurance that both the Egyptian nobles and the priests of Ammon were on her side. At this Shabaluliuma was persuaded of her sincerity and had hastened to make peace with Horam and was even now preparing to send his son Shubatu to Egypt. It was agreed that Shubatu should set forth from Kardesh on an auspicious day, with a great quantity of presents for Bakitaman. According to the last clay tablet that had been received, he was already on his way to Egypt with his suite. By all the gods of Egypt! I said in amazement. How am I to help you? I am but a physician and cannot incline the heart of a mad woman to Horam. Horam replied, you helped us once before, and he who once takes up the or must row whether he will or no. You must journey to meet Prince Shubatu and see that he never reaches Egypt. I do not know how you will contrive this and do not wish to know. I say only that we cannot openly murder him, for this would cause another war with the Hittites. I prefer to choose the time for that myself. His words alarmed me, and my knees began to tremble. My heart turned to water, and my tongue stumbled as I said, though it be true that I once helped you, yet I did it as much for my own sake as for Egypt's. This prince has never wronged me and I have seen him but once outside your tent on the day of Aziru's death. No, Horam, you shall not make an assassin of me. I would rather die, for there is no more shameful crime. In giving poison to Pharaoh Akhenaten I acted for his own good, he was sick, and I was his friend. Horam scowled and smote his leg with his whip, and Eie said, Sinew, you are a wise man and can see that we must not lose a whole kingdom beneath the couch of a capricious woman. Believe me, there is no other way. The prince must die on his way to Egypt, whether by accident or by illness is indifferent to me. You must journey to meet him in the desert of Sinai, you will go at the orders of Princess Bakitaman, as a physician, to examine him and see whether he is competent to fulfill the duties of a husband. 
He will readily believe this and will receive you cordially, with many questions as to Bakitama. Even princes are human, and I fancy he is most curious to know by what manner of sorceress Egypt hopes to bind him. Sinew, your task will be easy, and you will not despise the gifts its fulfillment will bring you, for they will make you a rich man. Horam said, choose quickly, Sinew, between life and death. Should you refuse, we cannot allow you to live now that you know so much, though you were a hundred times my friend. The name your mother gave you was an ill omen, already you have learned too many of the secrets of the pharaohs. One word, and I slit your throat from ear to ear, though unwillingly, for you are our best agent and we cannot entrust the task to any other. You are bound to us through a joint crime, and this crime we shall also share with you, if indeed you call that a crime which frees Egypt from the power of the Hittites and of a mad woman. Thus I found myself caught in a net my own deeds had knotted, and of which I could break not one mesh. I had bound my destiny with those of Eie and Horam forever. You know very well that I do not fear death, Horam, I said, in a vain attempt to give myself courage. I write for myself, without seeking to appear better than I am. To my shame I must confess that the thought of death filled me with fear that night, chiefly because it came on me so swiftly. I thought of the swallows darting flight above the river and of the wine from the harbor, I thought of the goose muti roasted in the Daban manor, and life was suddenly very sweet to me. I thought also of Egypt and reflected that Pharaoh Agneton had had to die that Egypt might live and that Horam might avert the Hittite attack by force of arms. Yet Agneton was my friend. This prince of a foreign land was quite unknown to me, and doubtless he had done such deeds in the course of the war as to merit a thousand deaths. Why should I hesitate to murder him to save Egypt once again since I had already slain Agneton? I answered, lay aside your knife, Forum, for the sight of a blunt knife is irritating to me. Be it as you say. I will save Egypt from the power of the Hittites, though how I do not yet know. In all probability I shall lose my life in the doing of it, for the Hittites will certainly slay me if the prince dies. But I care little for my life and I do not desire the Hittites to rule in Egypt. I undertake this for the sake neither of gifts nor of fair promises, but because the deed was written in the stars before my birth and may not be evaded. Receive the crowns from my hand, Horam and Eie, receive your crowns and bless my name, for I, an insignificant physician, have made pharaohs of you. I felt a great desire to laugh as I said this. I reflected that the sacred blood ran most probably in my own veins and that I was the only rightful heir to the throne of the pharaohs, while Eie was by origin no more than a minor priest of the sun and the parents of Horam smelled of cattle and cheese. At that moment I saw them both for what they were, robbers despoiling the dying body of Egypt, children playing with crowns and emblems of power, so chained and fettered by their desires that happiness could never be theirs. I said to Horam, Horam, my friend, the crown is heavy. You will learn this some hot day when toward evening the cattle come down to the water's edge to drink and the voices about you fall silent. But Horam said, make haste now and go. A ship awaits you, and you must meet Shubatu in the Sinai desert before he reaches Tanis with his suite. Thus I departed once more from Thebes, suddenly and by night. I went aboard Horam's swiftest ship, taking my medicine chest, some wine, and the remains of the roast goose that Muti had served me for dinner. Once more I was alone, in a loneliness exceeding that of other men, for there was no one to whom I could lay bare my innermost thoughts and reveal the secret that, if it were made known, would have occasioned the death of thousands. I had therefore to be wilier than a serpent, and I was goaded on by the knowledge that if caught I should suffer a hideous death at the hands of the Hittites. I was sorely tempted to abandon the task and seek refuge in some remote place, like my namesake sinew of the legend, and let destiny roll forward over Egypt. Had I acted so, the course of events might well have altered and the world today been otherwise. Yet now in my old age I perceive that all rulers are in essence alike and all nations also. It signifies little who rules or which nation oppresses another since ultimately it is the poor who suffer. 
But I did not flee, being weak. When a mortal is weak, he lets himself be led even to the commission of a fearful deed sooner than choose his own way. Therefore, Prince Shubatu must die. Sitting beneath the golden awning with a jar of wine beside me, I strove to hit on some way of killing that would remain undiscovered, so neither I nor Egypt might be held answerable. The task was no easy one, for the prince would certainly travel in a style befitting his rank. The Hittites, being suspicious by nature, no doubt kept a sharp watch upon his safety. Even if I met him alone in the desert, I could not have slain him with such means as offered, for spear and arrow leave traces, and the crime would have been manifest. I considered whether I might lure him to seek me with the basilisk of the desert, whose eyes are green stones, and hurl him into a crevasse so that I could report that his foot had slipped and that he had broken his neck. But this plan was childish, for I was certain never to be left alone with him. As for poison, the Hittites were ever attended by cupbearers who tasted both food and drink beforehand so that this also was impracticable. I then remembered stories of the secret poisons of the priests and of the Golden House. I had heard that there were ways of introducing poison into fruit still growing green upon the tree so that whoever plucked and ate the fruit when ripe met his death. There were also certain scrolls that brought slow death to him who opened them, and flowers whose scent, when priests had handled them, was fatal. But these were secrets of the priesthood, and I fancy that many of these tales were tales only. Even had they been true and I conversant with them, I could not well have cultivated fruit trees in the desert. No Hittite prince would open a scroll, he would hand it to his scribe. Nor were the Hittites in the habit of smelling flowers but rather slashed at their stems with whips and trod them underfoot. I wished I had captor as cunning to help me, but I could not involve him in this affair. Besides, he was still in Syria collecting his dues. I summoned up my powers of invention and all my medical science, for a doctor is familiar with death, and with the materials at his command he may bring death as readily as life to his patients. If Prince Shubatu had been ill and I appointed to tend him, I could have tended him to death at my ease, according to all the laws of medicine, nor could any self-respecting physician have condemned my treatment since throughout all ages the medical faculty have helped one another to bury their dead. But Shubatu was not ill, and if he were to sicken he would summon a Hittite rather than an Egyptian physician. I have set forth my musings in detail, to show how exacting was the task Horam had laid on me, but now I will speak only of what I did. In the house of life at Memphis I replenished my stock of drugs, and no one marveled at the prescriptions I wrote, for what to a layman is deadly poison may in the hands of a physician be a sound remedy. Then without further delay I continued my journey to Tanis, where I hired a chair and was furnished by the garrison with an escort of chariots to attend me along the great military road through the desert. Horam's information proved correct. I met Shubatu and his suite three days out from Tanis, encamped by a well. Shubatu also traveled in a chair to save his strength, and he brought with him many pack asses laden with gifts for Princess Bakitaman. Heavy chariots ensured safety on his journey, and light chariots reconnoitred at the road ahead, for King Shabaluliuma had commanded him to be prepared for all surprise attacks, being well aware that the expedition was far from agreeable to Horon. But the Hittites displayed great cordiality and courtesy to me and the officers. Of my modest escort, as is their way when they receive as a present what they cannot attain by force of arms. They received us in the camp they had pitched for the night, and having helped the Egyptian officers to set up our tents, they surrounded us with many guards, saying that they desired to defend us against robbers and against the lions of the desert, that we might sleep in peace. When Prince Shubatu heard that I had been sent by Princess Bakitaman, his curiosity got the better of him, and he summoned me into his presence. He was a splendid-looking young man whose eyes, now that he was not drunk as when I had last seen him, were large and limpid. Happiness and interest brought color into his dark face. His nose was as noble as the beak of a bird of prey, his teeth gleamed like the teeth of a wild beast, and he laughed with pleasure at the sight of me. I handed him a letter from Princess Bakitaman, forged by Eie, 
and stretched forth my hands at knee level before him with every mark of veneration, as though he were already my sovereign. I was greatly diverted to note that before receiving me he had arrayed himself in the Egyptian manner and now found himself embarrassed by these garments, to which he was unaccustomed. He said to me, since my future consort has confided in you and you are physician to the household, I will conceal nothing from you. When a prince marries, he is bound to his partner. My consort's country shall be my country, Egypt's customs my customs. I have striven as far as may be to adopt them already, that I may not come as a stranger to Thebes. I am impatient to see the wonders of Egypt of which so much has been told me and to become acquainted with its mighty gods, which henceforth shall be my gods also. But most eager am I to see my royal consort, for by her will I found a new ruling race in Egypt. Tell me about her, therefore. Tell me of her size and her figure and of the breadth of her loins as if I were already an Egyptian. Do no conceal any flaw in her from me, but trust me like a brother, as I trust you. His trust was shown in a group of officers who stood behind him with drawn swords and in the soldiers who guarded the tent door with spears directed at my back. But I feigned to notice nothing of this. Bowing to the ground before him, I said, my royal lady, Princess Bakitaman, is one of the fairest women in Egypt. Because of her sacred blood she has preserved her virginity although she is some years older than yourself. Her beauty is timeless, her face is like the moon, and her eyes like lotus flowers. As a physician I can assure you that her loins are fit for childbearing although narrow, like those of all Egyptian women. She has sent me to meet you, to satisfy herself that your royal blood is worthy of hers and that you can fulfill the bodily requirements of a husband without causing her any disappointment. She awaits you with impatience, having never in her life been possessed by a man. Prince Shubatu threw out his chest and raised his elbows to shoulder level to display the muscles of his arms, and he said, my arms can draw the strongest bow, and with the grip of my knees I can squeeze the breath from an ass. There is no fault to be found with my face, as you may see, and I cannot remember when I was last ill. I said to him, you are indeed an inexperienced youth and ignorant of the customs of Egypt if you think that an Egyptian princess is a bow to be drawn or a donkey to be gripped between the knees. This is far from being the case, and it is clear that I must give you a few lectures in the Egyptian arts of love, that you may not cover yourself with ignominy in the eyes of the princess. She was indeed well advised to send me hither so that as a physician I may initiate you into the customs of Egypt. My word sorely wounded Prince Shubatu, for he was a high-metal boy and like all Hittites was proud of his virility. His officers burst out laughing, and this still further incensed him. He whitened in fury and ground his teeth. But to me he sought to maintain the suave Egyptian manner, and he said as composedly as he could, I am no such inexperienced boy as you seem to think, and my spear has pierced many a fair skin. I do not think that your princess will be ill-content with the arts of the land of Hatti. I answered, I readily believe in your strength, my ruler, but you must have been mistaken when you said you could not remember when last you were ill. I am a physician and can see by your eyes and your cheeks that you are sick now and are troubled by a flux. There is no human being who does not end by believing he is sick when assured long and constantly that he is so. At heart everyone feels the desire to be pampered and tended. Doctors in every age have been aware of this, and the knowledge has made them rich. I had the further advantage of knowing that the desert springs contained lye which loosens the bowels of those who are not seasoned to it. Prince Shubatu was astonished at my words and cried, You are certainly mistaken, Sinu the Egyptian. I feel in no way ill, although I must admit that I have a flux and have had continually to squat by the roadside in the course of my journey. But how you know this I cannot think. You must certainly be more skilled than my own physician, who has taken no note whatever of my disorder. He listened to himself, and feeling his eyes and brow he said, in truth I do feel a burning in my eyes after staring all day at the red sand of the desert. My forehead also is hot and I am not as well as I could wish. 
I said to him, it would be well for your physician to give you a medicine to ease your stomach and give you a good sleep. The stomach disorders of the desert are severe, and I know that a number of Egyptians died of them on their march to Syria. No one knows the origin of these complaints. Some say that they are born of the poison. O oh, use desert winds, some blame the water, and others the locusts. I do not doubt that tomorrow you will be well again and able to continue your journey if your physician will mix you a good draught this evening. He began to ponder at this. His eyes narrowed, and glancing at his chiefs, he said to me, smiling like a mischievous boy, do you mix me such a potion, sinew? Without doubt you are more familiar with these strange desert diseases than my own attendant. But I was no such fool. I raised my hands in protest and said, far be it from me. I dare not prepare any such remedy for you. Should you become worse, you would blame me and say that as an Egyptian I wished you ill. Your own physician will tend you as well as I, and better. He is familiar with your constitution and your former disorders. He need do no more than give you a simple binding medicine. He smiled and said, perhaps your counsel is good. I mean to eat and drink with you, that you may tell me of my royal consort and of Egyptian customs, and I do not desire to be forever running out and squatting behind the tent during your account. He summoned his own physician, who was an irritable and suspicious Hittite, and we took professional counsel together. When he found that I had no desire to compete with him, he conceived a liking for me and did as I advised. He prepared a binding medicine of exceptional strength, which I had my own reason for prescribing. When it was ready, he drank from the cup before handing it to the prince. I knew that the prince was not sick, but I desired his sweet to believe that he was. I desired also to bind his stomach, that the draught I proposed to administer might not pass through him over rapidly. Before the meal he had ordered in my honor I went to my tent and drank my stomach full of oil despite the nausea it caused me, so as to preserve my own life. I then took a small jar of wine with which I had mixed the poison. This jar, which I had resealed, held enough for two cups only. I returned to the prince's tent with it, sat on his mat, and ate the dishes his slaves set before me, and drank the wine his stewards poured into our cups. Despite severe nausea I related lurid stories of Egyptian customs to divert the prince and his followers. Prince Shubatu laughed with flashing teeth, he slapped me on the back and said, you are an entertaining fellow, sinew, Egyptian though you be, and when I have settled in Egypt I will make you my physician. Truly I choke with laughter and forget my disordet when you tell of Egyptian marriage practices, although I fancy the Egyptians have adopted them only to avoid the begetting of children. I mean to teach Egypt many Hittite practices, and I will make my officers regional governors, which I think will be most beneficial to Egypt, so soon as I have given the princess her due. He smote his knees, and being by now somewhat exalted with the wine, he laughed and said, in truth I could wish the princess already lay on my mat, for your tales have greatly inflamed me, sinew, and I know I shall cause her to groan in her ecstasy. By the holy heavens and the earth mother! When the land of Hatti and Egypt are united, no kingdom on earth will be able to withstand our power, and we shall gather under our sway the four corners of the world. But Egypt must first be imbued with iron and fire until every man there believes that death is better than life. All this shall come about, and soon. He raised his goblet and drank, and he poured libations to the earth mother and to the heavens until his cup was empty. By now all the Hittites were somewhat fuddled, and my merry tales had melted their misgivings. I profited by the occasion and said, I would not insult you or your wine, Shubatu, but it is plain that you have never tasted the wine of Egypt. Had you tasted it, all other wine would seem to you as insipid as water. Forgive me, therefore, if I drink of my own wine, for that alone can make me drunk, which is the reason I always take it with me to the banquets of strangers. I shook my wine jar and broke the seal before his eyes, and in feigned drunkenness I poured the wine into my cup so that it slopped on the ground. I drank and exclaimed, Ah, this is the wine of Memphis, pyramid wine paid for in gold, strong, sweet, 
and heady, unparalleled in all the world. The wine was indeed strong and good, and I had mixed myrrh with it so that the whole tent was perfumed when I opened the jar. Even through wine and myrrh I tasted the tang of death. I spilled much of it down my chin as I drank, but the Hittites attributed this to my fuddled condition. Prince Shubatu was curious, and holding out his cup to me, he said, I am no stranger to you. Tomorrow I shall be your lord and pharaoh. Let me taste your wine, or I shall not believe it is as excellent as you say. But I pressed the wine jar to my breast and refused him earnestly, saying, This wine does not suffice for two, and I have no more with me, and I desire to get drunk this evening because this is a day of great rejoicing for all Egypt and the land of Hatti, he haw, he haw. I brayed like a donkey and pressed the wine jar closer. The Hittites doubled up with laughing and smote their knees, but Shubatu was accustomed to having every wish granted. He begged and besought me to let him taste of my wine until at last I wept and filled his cup until my little jar was empty. Nor was it hard for me to weep, so great was my terror at this moment. When Shubatu had been given the wine, he looked about him as if warned by some misgiving. Then in the Hittite manner he held out the cup to me saying, Hello my cup, as you are my friend, and I will do you a like favor. He said this because he did not wish to seem suspicious and let his cup burr taste the wine. I took a deep draught from his cup, whereupon he emptied it, tasted the wine, and seemed to be listening to his body with his head on one side as he said, Truly your wine is strong, sinew. It mounts to the head like smoke and burns the stomach like fire, but it leaves a bitter taste in the mouth, which I will rinse away with wine from the mountains. He refilled his cup with his own wine, thus swilling it out. I knew the poison would not take effect until the morning because his bowels were bound and he had eaten copiously. I swallowed as much wine as I could and pretended to be very drunk. I waited yet half a water measure's time before I bade them lead me to my tent, lest I should arouse suspicion in the minds of the Hittites. I clung tightly to my empty wine jar that it might not be left behind to be examined by them, when the Hittites, with many coarse jests, had put me to bed and left me to myself, I rose hastily. Thrusting my finger down my throat, I vomited the poison and the protecting oil. So acute was my fear that the sweat poured off me and my knees trembled, and perhaps the poison had to some extent affected me. Therefore, I rinsed my stomach many times, I drank cleansing draughts and vomited repeatedly until at last I threw up from pure fright without the help of emetics. Not until I was as limp as a wet rag did I rinse out the wine jar, smash it, and bury the pieces in the sand. After this I lay sleepless, trembling with fear and with the effects of the poison. All night long Shubatu's great eyes gazed at me. I saw his face before me in the darkness and could not forget his proud, careless laugh and his dazzling teeth. Hittite pride came to my aid. Next morning when Prince Shubatu felt indisposed, he would not confess to it or put off the journey because of the pains in his stomach. He stepped into his chair denying that he suffered, although this required great self-mastery. The journey continued all day, therefore, and when I passed his chair, he waved to me and strove to smile. His physician twice administered binding and painkilling medicines, thus aggravating his condition by allowing the poison to exert its full effect. A powerful purge might even then have saved his life. In the afternoon he fell into a deep coma. His eyes turned in his head, and his drawn face assumed a yellow pallor, striking terror to the heart of his physician, who summoned me to his aid. When I saw his desperate plight, I had no need to feign terror, for it was real enough and chilled me despite the day's heat. I felt ill already from the poison. I said that I knew the symptoms to be those of the desert sickness, of which I had warned Shubatu the evening before and of which I had read the signs in his face, although he would not heed me. The caravan halted, and we tended him where he lay in his chair giving him stimulants and cleansing draughts and laying hot stones to his stomach. I saw to it that the Hittite physician alone mixed the drugs and administered them, forcing them between the prince's clenched teeth. 
I knew that he would die and desired by my counsel to render his death as painless and easy as might be since I could not do more. When evening came we bore him to his tent. The Hittites gathered outside to mourn aloud, to rend their clothes, strew ashes in their hair, and gash themselves with knives. They were in mortal fear, knowing that King Shabaluliuma would have no mercy on them if the prince died in their charge. I watched with the Hittite physician at the bedside of the prince and saw this fair youth, who but the day before had been robust and happy, wasting away in pallor and ugliness before my eyes. The Hittite physician, filled with suspicion and despair, made continual examination of his condition, but the symptoms were no different from those of a severe stomach disorder. No one thought of poison since I had drunk the same wine from his cup. I had carried out my task with noteworthy skill and with great profit to Egypt, yet I felt no pride as I watched Prince Shubar to die. On the following day he regained consciousness. As death approached, he called softly for his mother, like a sick child. In a low, pitiful voice he moaned, Mother, mother, my lovely mother. But when the pains loosed their grip of him, his face lit up in a boyish smile and he remembered that he was of royal blood. He summoned his officers and said, Let no one bear the blame for my death, for it has come on me in the form of the desert sickness, and I have been tended by the best physician of the land of Hatti and the most eminent physician of Egypt. Their arts have not availed to cure me, because it is the will of the heavens and of the earth mother that I should die and assuredly the desert is ruled not by the earth mother but by the gods of Egypt, and it exists to protect Egypt. The Hittites must not seek to cross the desert, for my death is a sign of this, even as the defeat of our chariots in the desert was a sign although we would not heed it. Give the physicians a present worthy of me when I am dead. And you, Sinew, greet Princess Bakitaman and say that I release her from her promise and feel great sorrow because I may not carry her to her marriage bed for my own joy and hers. Bring her this greeting, for as I die I see her floating in my dreams like a story princess, and I die with her timeless beauty before my eyes though I have never seen her. He went with a smile on his lips, for death comes at times like bliss after great agony, and his eyes before they faded saw strange visions. I surveyed him trembling, forgetful of his race, his speech, and the color of his skin, I remembered only that he, my fellow man, died by my hand and my wickedness. Hardened though I was by all the deaths I had witnessed during my lifetime, yet my heart quaked at the passing of Prince Shubatu, and the tears poured down my cheeks. The Hittites laid his body in strong wine and honey that they might bear it to the royal tombs, where eagles and wolves watched over the eternal sleep of kings. They were touched by my emotion, and at my desire they willingly certified on a clay tablet that I was in no way to blame for Prince Shubatu's death but had exerted every art to save him. They attested this with their seals and with the seal of Prince Shubatu, that no shadow might fall on me in Egypt because of their lord's death. For they judged Egypt by themselves and believed that when I told Princess Bakitaman of Prince Shubatu's fate she would have me put to death. Thus I saved Egypt from the power of the Hittites, and I ought to have rejoiced. I did not, being oppressed with the sense that death followed ever at my heels. I had become a physician that I might heal and give life, but my father and mother died because of my wickedness, Minea died because of my weakness, Merit and little Thoth because of my blindness, and Pharaoh Agneton because of my hatred and my friendship and for the sake of Egypt. All whom I loved died a violent death, Prince Shubatu also, whom I had grown to love during his death agony. Everywhere, a curse went with me. I returned to Tanis, to Memphis, and at last to Thebes. I gave orders for my ship to be made fast at the key of the Golden House, and having entered the presence of Eie and Horam, I said to them, Your will has been done. Prince Shubatu has perished in the Sinai Desert, and no shadow falls on Egypt because of his death. They rejoiced greatly at my words. Eie took the golden chain of the scepter bearer from his neck and hung it about my own, and Horam said, Relate this also to Princess Bakitaman, she will not believe us if we tell her of it, but will fancy that I have had him assassinated out of jealousy. Princess Bakitaman received me. 
She had painted her cheeks and mouth brick red, but in her dark, oval eyes lurked death. I said to her, your chosen, Prince Shubatu, released you from your promise before he died. He died in the desert of Sinai, of the desert sickness. No arts of mine availed to save him nor yet those of the Hittite physician. She took the golden bangles from her wrists and setting them on mine, she said, your news is good, sinew, and I thank you for it. I have already been initiated as a priestess of Sekhmet and my crimson robe is in readiness for the festival. Nevertheless, this desert sickness is only too familiar, and I know that my brother Agneton, whom I loved with a sister's love, died of the same. Accursed be you, therefore, sinew, accursed to all eternity. May your grave also be accursed and your name fall into perpetual oblivion. You have made the throne of the pharaohs a playground for robbers, and in my blood you have desecrated the blood of the pharaohs. Bowing deeply before her, I stretched forth my hands and said, Be it as you say. I left her, and she bade her slave sweep the floor after me all the way to the threshold of the golden house. During this time the body of Tutankhamun had been prepared to withstand death, and Eie had the priests bear him swiftly westward to his eternal resting place, which had been hewn in the rock in the valley of the tombs of the kings. He had with him many presents, although Eie kept for himself a great portion of the treasure that Tutankhamun had intended for burial. As soon as the entrance to the tomb had been sealed, Eie pronounced the period of mourning at an end, and Horam sent his chariots to occupy the streets of Thebes. None rebelled when Eie was crowned pharaoh, for the people were weary, as a beast that is goaded with spears along an endless path is weary. No one questioned his right to the crown. Thus Eie was crowned pharaoh. The priests, whom he had bribed with countless gifts, anointed him with holy oil in the great temple, and the people shouted his praise for he distributed bread and beer among them, and so poor had Egypt become that these were now munificent gifts. But many were aware that henceforth the true ruler of Egypt was Horam, and they wondered silently why he did not himself take the power into his own hands instead of allowing the aged and detested Eie to ascend the throne of the pharaohs. But Horam knew well what he was doing, for the people's cup of suffering was not yet drained to the dregs. Bad news from the land of Kush summoned him to war against the Negroes, and after that he still had to renew the conflict against the Hittites for the conquest of Syria. For this reason he wanted the people to blame Eie for their sufferings and want, that later they might praise the name of Horam as victor and restorer of peace. Eie never considered this, being dazzled by power and by the glitter of the crowns, and he willingly fulfilled his part of the bargain he had struck with Horam on the day of Agneton's death. The priests brought Princess Bakitaman in ceremonial procession to the temple of Sekhmet, where they arrayed her in the crimson robe and raised her on Sekhmet's altar. Horam arrived at the temple with his men, in celebration of his victory over the Hittites. All Thebes shouted his praise. Having distributed golden chains and tokens of honor among his men, he let them go. Then he stepped into the temple, and the priests closed its copper doors behind him. Sekhmet appeared to him in the shape of Princess Bakitaman, and he took her. He was a warrior, and had waited long. That night all Thebes celebrated the festival of Sekhmet, and the sky glowed red with the light of lamps and torches. Horam scum drank all the taverns dry and smashed in the doors of the pleasure houses. At dawn the soldiers once more assembled before the temple of Sekhmet to see Horam come forth. When the copper gates were opened and he stepped out, they cried aloud and swore in many tongues, for Sekhmet had been faithful to her lion's head. Horanheb's face and arms and shoulders were scratched and bleeding as if a lion had torn him with its claws. This diverted his men greatly, and they loved him for it. But Princess Bakitaman was borne away by the priests to the Golden House, without showing herself to the people. Such was the bridal night of my friend Horam, and I know not what pleasure he had of it. Shortly afterward he mustered his troops and went to mobilize his army at the first cataract in the south, in order to march on the land of Kush. Eie exulted blindly in his power, and he said to me, In the whole land of Kem no one stands higher than myself, 
and it matters not whether I live or die, Pharaoh dies not, he lives forever. I shall step aboard the golden boat of my father Ammon, and sail across the heavens into the west. I am already an old man, and my deeds glare out at me from the darkness of night. I am glad that I need no longer fear death. But I mocked him, saying, You are an old man and I believed you wise. You cannot suppose that the stinking oil of the priests has rendered you immortal in the twinkling of an eye. Royal headdress or none, you are the same man still. Death will soon overtake you, and life depart. His mouth began to quiver, and fear glinted in his eyes as he said plaintively, Have I then committed all these crimes in vain? Was it in vain that I sowed death about me all my days? No, no, assuredly you are wrong, sinew. The priests will save me from the abyss of death and will preserve my body to all eternity. My body must be immortal since I am Pharaoh, and for the same reason I cannot be held guilty for my deeds. Thus did his reason begin to fade, and he had no joy of his power. In the horror of death he coddled himself and dared not even drink wine. His diet was dry bread and boiled milk. As time went on, he was filled with ever-increasing dread of assassins, and whole days passed during which he dared not taste food for fear of poison. His old age found him entangled in the net of his own actions, and he became so suspicious and cruel that all shunned him. A seed quickened for Bakitaman, and in her rage at this she harmed herself in attempting to destroy the child while it was yet in her womb. The life in her was stronger than death, and when her time came, she bore a son to Horam, and in painful labor, for her loins were narrow. The physicians and slaves were compelled to hide the child from her lest she do it harm. Many tales were afterward told of this child, such as that he had been born with the head of a lion or with a helmet. I can bear witness that there was nothing abnormal about the boy, who was healthy and robust. Horam gave him the name of Rameses. Horam was still fighting in the land of Cush, and his chariots wrought great destruction among the Negroes. He burned their straw-built villages and sent women and children into slavery in Egypt, but he enrolled the men in his army, where they proved good warriors, no longer having any families to distract them. Thus Horam built up a new army with which to meet the Hittites, for these men were strong, and when once they had worked themselves to a frenzy with the sound of their sacred drums, they felt no fear of death. From the land of Cush Horam also sent great herds of cattle to Egypt so that grain grew luxuriantly once more in the land of Chem, the children had no lack of milk, and the priests were well supplied with beasts for the sacrifice. Whole tribes fled from their homes in Cush into the jungles, into the regions of the elephants and giraffes, beyond the boundary stones of Egypt. For years the land of Cush was deserted. After two years of war Horam returned to Thebes, bringing with him much booty. He distributed gifts and held victory celebrations for ten days and ten nights. All work stopped and drunken soldiers crawled about the streets bleating like goats, and the women of Thebes were delivered in due time of dark-skinned children. Horam held his son in his arms and taught him to walk, and he said to me proudly, See, sinew. A new race of kings has sprung from my loins, and in the veins of my son runs the sacred blood although I was born with dung between the toes. He also went to lie, but Eie in his fear shut and barricaded the door against him and cried in his shrill old voice, Begone from me, Horam. I am Pharaoh and I know that you have come to slay me and to set the crowns on your head. But Horam laughed heartily, kicked open his door, and shook him, saying, I do not mean to kill you, old fox. You old bored, I shall not take your life, for you are more to me than a mere father-in-law, and your life is precious. It is true that your lungs whistle, and your mouth slobbers, and your knees are feeble, but you must hold out, lie. You must survive another war that Egypt may have a pharaoh over whom to pour out its wrath while I am away. To his consort Bakitaman, Horam brought great gifts, gold dust in plaited baskets, heads of lions he had killed, ostrich feathers, and live monkeys. She would not even look at them and said to him, In the sight of men I am your wife, and I have borne you a son. Be content with that, 
and know that if ever you lay hand on me again I shall spit on your couch and deceive you as no wife has yet deceived her husband. To bring shame on you I will take pleasure with slaves and porters and will lie with donkey drivers in the public places of Thebes. Your hands and body smell of blood, and they sicken me. Her opposition inflamed Horam's desire for her. He came to me complaining bitterly and said, Sinew, mix me a draught which I may give her to make her sleep so that at least I may go to her then and have my way with her. I refused, but he sought out other physicians who gave him dangerous drugs. He administered these to her secretly. When he rose from her embrace, she hated him more bitterly than before and said, Remember what I told you, remember my warning. Soon Horam departed for Syria to prepare his campaign against the Hittites, for as he said, the great pharaohs set up their boundary stones in Kadesh, and not until my chariots have entered Kadesh once more will I be content. When Princess Bakitaman perceived that once more a seed quickened within her, she shut herself into her room in the desire to be alone with her degradation. Servants were obliged to leave food for her outside her door, and when her time drew near, the physicians had her secretly watched. They feared lest she bring forth the child alone and send him down the river in a reed boat, as those mothers did who incurred shame by giving birth. She did not do this, when her time came she summoned her physicians. The pains of her labor brought a smile to her lips, and she brought forth a son to whom, without consulting Horam, she gave the name of Setos. So bitterly did she hate this child that she called him he who was born of Set. When she recovered from her lying in, she bade her slaves anoint her and array her in royal linen. Having been ferried over to the other shore, she went alone to the fish market in Thebes. There she spoke with donkey men and water carriers and gutters of fish. She said to them, I am Princess Bakitaman, the consort of Egypt's great general, Horon. Two sons have I borne him, but he is a dull and slothful man and smells of blood. I have no pleasure in him. Come and take pleasure with me that I may enjoy you, for your scarred hands and your wholesome smell of dung please me, and I also like the smell of fish. The men of the fish market marveled at her words. They were frightened and sought to evade her, but she followed them with persistence, and bearing her beauty to them she said, Am I not fair? Why do you hesitate? Know that even should you consider me old and ugly, yet I desire from each of you no other gift than a stone, and let the stone correspond in size to the pleasure I give you. Such a thing had never before happened to the men of the fish market. Their eyes brightened at her beauty. The royal linen of her dress lured them, and the perfume of her salves mounted to their heads. They said one to another, Truly she must be a goddess who reveals herself to us because we have found favor with her. We should do wrong to oppose her will, and the pleasure she offers us must be divine. Others said, At least our pleasure will cost us little, for even Negro women demand at least one copper piece. No doubt she is a priestess who is collecting stones with which to build a new temple to Bast, and we shall perform a deed acceptable to the gods if we do as she bids us. They followed her to the reed swamps by the river bank, where she led them to be out of the sight of men. And there all day Bakitaman gave pleasure to the men from the fish market, cheating them of none of their delight but greatly favoring them. Many brought her large stones such as are bought of Quarrimen at a high price, so highly did they rate the pleasure she gave them. They said one to another, truly we have never met such a woman. Her mouth is melted honey and her breasts ripe apples, and her embrace is as hot as the charcoal bed on which fish are grilled. They begged her to return soon to the fish market and promised to gather many large stones for her. She smiled at them modestly, thanking them for their kindness and for the great joy they had given her. When in the evening she returned to the golden house, she was obliged to hire a sturdier craft to ferry across all the stones she had collected in the course of the day. Next morning, she took a heavier boat, and when the slave women had rowed her over to Thebes, she left them to await her on the quay and made her way to the vegetable market. There she spoke to the farmers who came into the city at dawn with the oxen and asses, men whose hands were hardened by the soil, whose skin was rough and weather-beaten. 
She also spoke to the street sweepers, the emptiers of latrines, and the negro guards, luring them and bearing her beauty to them so that they abandoned their loads of farm produce, their oxen, and their donkeys. They left the streets unswept and followed her to the weed swamps, saying, such a delicacy does not come the way of the poor every day. Her skin is not like that of our wives, and the scent of her is like the scent of the nobles. We should be mad not to take the pleasure she offers us. They took pleasure with her and brought her stones. The farmers brought doorsteps from the taverns, and the guards pilfered stones from Pharaoh's buildings. In the evening Princess Bakitaman offered modest thanks to all the men from the vegetable market for their kindness to her and for the joy they had given her. They helped her to load the boat with stones until it was so deeply laden that it was near sinking, and the slave women had much ado to row it across the river to the quay by the Golden House. That same evening it was known to all Thebes that the cat-head goddess had revealed herself to the people and taken pleasure with them. The strangest rumors ran rife about the city, for those who no longer believed in the gods found other explanations. The following day, Princess Bakitaman went among the men of the charcoal market, and that evening the reed swamps by the river were sooty and trampled. The priests in many small temples complained bitterly, for the charcoal sellers were godless men who thought nothing of tearing stones from the temple walls with which to pay for their pleasure. They licked their lips and boasted among themselves, saying, Truly we have tasted paradise. Her lips melted in our mouths, her breasts were like glowing brands in our hands, and we did not know that such delights existed in the world. When it became known in Thebes that the goddess had appeared to the people for the third time, the city was filled with a great unrest. Even respectable men left their wives and went to the taverns, and at night they took stones from Pharaoh's buildings so that next morning every man in Thebes went from market to market with a stone under his arm, impatiently awaiting the appearance of the cathead one. The priests were perturbed and sent forth their guards to arrest the woman who was the source of this outrage and scandal. That day Princess Bakitaman lay in the golden house, resting after her exertions. She smiled at all who addressed her and behaved in a notably agreeable manner. The court were much astonished at her demeanor, and no one dreamed as yet that she was the mysterious woman who had appeared to the people of Thebes and taken pleasure with charcoal burners and cleaners of fish. Princess Bakitaman, having surveyed the stones of varying size and color that she had collected, summoned into her garden the builder of the royal cattle sheds and said to him, I have gathered these stones by the river bank, and they are sacred to me. Each one is linked with a joyous memory, the bigger the stone, the more joyous the memory. Build me a pavilion with these stones that I may have a roof over my head, for my consort neglects me, as you have doubtless heard. Let this pavilion be spacious and its walls high, and I will collect more stones as you need them. The master builder was a simple man and he said humbly, Hi Princess Bakitaman, I fear that my arts may not suffice to build a pavilion worthy of your rank. These stones are of different sizes and colors so that the fitting of them together will be a matter of great difficulty. Lay this task rather on some temple builder or artist, for I fear that my lack of skill may spoil the beauty of your thought. But Princess Bakitaman touched his bony shoulder shyly and said, I am but a poor woman whose husband is neglectful, and I cannot afford to call eminent master builders to my service. Nor can I offer you a worthy present for the work, as I should wish to do. When the pavilion is completed, I will inspect it with you, and if I find it well done, I will take pleasure with you there, this I promise. I have nothing to give you but a little joy." The master builder was greatly inflamed by her words, and surveying her beauty, he remembered the tales in which princesses fell in love with humble men and took pleasure with them. His fear of Horam was great, but his desire greater, and the words of Bakitaman flattered him exceedingly. Swiftly, he began to build the pavilion, exercising all his arts in the work and dreaming as he built. He built his dreams into the walls of the pavilion. Desire and love made of him a great artist, for he saw Princess Bakitaman every day. His heart glowed and he toiled like a madman, growing ever paler with labor and with longing. 
From the stones of different colors and sizes he built a pavilion such as had never before been seen. The stones Bakitaman had amassed were soon exhausted, and she went once more to Thebes where she collected stones in all the markets, in the avenue of rams, and in the temple gardens. At last there was no part of Thebes where she had not gathered stones. By this time her doings were known of all, and the members of the court gathered in the garden to steal a glimpse of the pavilion. When the women of the court saw the height of the walls and the number of stones in them, great and small, they clapped their hands to their mouths and cried out in amazement. But no one dared say a word to the princess, and Iai, who with the authority of Pharaoh might have been able to curb her, was crazily jubilant at her behavior, believing that it would cause Horam exceedingly great vexation. Horam waged war in Syria, he captured Sidon, Smyrna, and Byblos from the Hittites, and sent many slaves and much plunder to Egypt, and to his wife he gave many magnificent presents. Everyone in Thebes knew what was going on in the Golden House, but there was no man bold enough to tell Horam of his consort's behavior. His own men, to whom he had assigned high positions, shut their eyes to it, saying among themselves, this is a family matter, and it is wiser to put one's hand between the upper and nether millstones than to interfere between husband and wife. For this reason Horam heard nothing of the matter, and I believe that this was best for Egypt, for the knowledge would most certainly have distracted his thoughts from the campaign. I have spoken much of what happened to others during Eie's reign, but little of myself. There is little to relate. The river of my life raced no longer, but ran smooth and slow again over a shallow bed. Year after year I lived under Muti's care. My feet were weary of trudging dusty roads, my eyes were weary of beholding the restlessness of the world, and my heart was weary of the world's vanity. I shut myself in my house and received no patience, save for a neighbor now and again and the very poor who had no presence to give the regular physicians. I had another pool dug in the courtyard and filled it with colored fish, and I sat all day beside it under my sycamore. Donkeys brayed in the street before my house, children played in the dust, and I gazed at the fish that swam lazily about in the cool water. The sooty sycamore put forth leaves again, and Muti tended me well, preparing good food for me and letting me drink wine in moderation when I so desired. She saw to it that I slept enough and did not overtax my strength. But food had lost its savor, and wine gave me no joy. When the chill of the evening came, the wine brought before me all my evil deeds, Pharaoh Akhenaten's dying face and the young face of Prince Shubatu. The desire to heal men had left me, for my hands, which I had hoped might be good hands, were accursed and engendered death. So I watched the fish in my pool and envied them. Their blood was cold, and their delights were cool, and they lived out their lives without having to breathe the hot air of the earth. As I sat there in my garden, I spoke with my heart and said, Be still, foolish heart, the fault is not yours. All is madness, good and evil have no meaning, greed alone, with hatred and desire, rule the world. The fault is not yours, sinew, for man is man and will never change. In vain you may try him with war and want, with pestilence and burning, with gods and with spears. By such trials he is but hardened to a greater savagery than the crocodiles, and the only good man is the man who is dead. But my heart gainsaid me, you may sit there and watch your fish, sinew, but I will give you no peace. Thousands and again thousands have died because of you, sinew. They have died from famine, pestilence, and wounds. They have died beneath the wheels of chariots and have perished on desert marches. Because of you children have died in their mother's wombs, because of you bent backs have come under the lash, because of you injustice tramples upon justice, because of you greed triumphs over good because of you robbers rule the world. Truly, countless numbers have died because of you, sinew. All who have died, and all who are yet dying are your brothers and die because of you. For this reason you hear their weeping in your dreams, sinew, and their weeping takes the savor from your food and lays waste all your happiness. But I hardened my spirit and said, the fishes are my brothers because they cannot utter vain speech. The wolves of the desert are my brothers and the lions of the wilderness, 
but man is not my brother because he knows what he does. My heart mocked me and said, does man then know what he does? You know, you have learning, and therefore I shall make you suffer until the day of your death, but the others do not know. You alone are guilty, sinew. Then I cried aloud and tore my clothes, saying, Cursed be my knowledge, cursed be my hands, cursed be my eyes. But most cursed be my mad heart, which gives me no peace but besieges me with false accusations. Bring me the scales of Osiris, that my lying heart may be weighed. Muti came hurrying from the kitchen, and wetting a cloth in the pool she bathed my head. With severe reproaches she put me to bed and gave me many bitter draughts until I grew quiet. For a long time I lay sick and raved to Muti of the scales of Osiris, of merit, and of little Thoth. She tended me faithfully, and I fancy she was overjoyed to be able to keep me in bed and feed me. She forbade me to sit in the garden in the heat of the day, because my hair had all come out, and my bald head could not bear the poisonous rays of the sun. Yet I had not sat in the sun, but in the cool shade of the sycamore, watching the fish, which were my brothers. After my recovery I was more peaceable and became reconciled even with my heart so that it no longer tormented me. And I spoke no more of merit and of little thought but kept them in my heart, knowing that their deaths were necessary if my measure were to be full and I to be alone. Had they dwelt with me, I should have been happy and at peace, and my heart would have been silent. But I must always be alone, according to the measure mitted to me, in token of which I had drifted alone down the river on the very night of my birth. One day I dressed myself secretly in the coarse garment of the poor, kicked the sandals from my feet, and left the house. I went to the quays and bore heavy burdens among the porters until my back hurt and my shoulders were crooked. I went to the vegetable market and gathered its trampled refuse for my food. I went to the charcoal market and worked the heavy bellows for the smiths. I did the work of slaves and porters, I ate their bread and drank their beer and said to them, there is no difference between one man and another, for all are born naked into the world. A man cannot be measured by the color of his skin, or by his speech, or by his clothes and jewels, but only by his heart. A good man is better than a bad man, and justice is better than injustice, and that is all I know. Thus I spoke to them before their mud huts in the evenings, as their wives lit fires in the street and the air was filled with the smell of fried fish. They laughed at me and said, You are mad, sinew, to do the work of slaves when you can read and write. No doubt you are involved in some crime and would hide yourself among us. In your talk there is a hint of Aten, whose name we may not utter. We shall not betray you to the guards but shall keep you among us to divert us with your prattle. But do not compare us with dirty Syrians and miserable Negroes, for though we be but slaves and porters we are at least Egyptians, proud of our color and our speech, our past and our future. I said to them, that is senseless talk. So long as a man is proud of himself and believes himself better than other men, so long will mankind be persecuted by fetters and flogging by spears and by birds of prey. A man should be judged by his heart alone. But they laughed aloud and smote their knees, saying, Truly you are a madman and must have grown up in a sack. A man cannot live unless he believes himself better than others, and there is no one so wretched but feels in some way above his neighbor. We are content to be wiser than you and craftier, although we are but poor men and slaves while you can read and write. I said to them, a good man is better than a bad one and justice better than injustice. But they answered bitterly, what is good and what is evil? If we slay a bad master who flogs us and cheats us of our food and lets our wives and children die, our deed is a good deed, but the guards bring us before Pharaoh's judges and cut off our ears and noses and hang us head downward from the wall. They gave me fish to eat, which their wives had cooked, and I drank their thin beer and said, Murder is the lowest crime of which a man can be guilty, and it is as wicked to slay in a good cause as in a bad. No man should be slain, but rather healed of his evil ways. They laid their hands over their mouths, looked about them, and said, We do not desire to slay anyone.
but if you would heal men of their wickedness and set justice in the place of wrong, go first among the nobles and the wealthy, and among Pharaoh's judges. You will find more wickedness and injustice there than among us. Do not blame us if because of your words they cut off your ears and send you to the mines or hang you head downward from the walls, for the words you utter are dangerous. Horam, our great commander, would without doubt have you killed were he to hear you speak thus to the people, for to slay in war is man's glory. I listened to their counsel and left them. Barefoot and clad in the grey garment of the poor I wandered about the streets of Thebes. I talked to the merchants who mix sand with their flour, to the mill owners who gagged their slaves with sticks that they might not eat of the corn they ground, and I spoke to the judges who stole the inheritance of the fatherless and gave wrong judgment in return for gifts. I spoke to them all and accused them because of their evil doing, and they listened to me in great astonishment. They said one to another, Who is this sinew who speaks thus boldly, despite his slave's garment? Let us be careful, for he must be a spy of Pharaoh's, or he would never venture to speak so to us. They listened to what I said, and inviting me into their rooms, they offered me presents and gave me wine to drink. The judges sought my counsel and gave judgment in favor of the poor against the rich so that there was great discontent in Thebes. Men said, in these days not even Pharaoh's judges can be trusted. They are more dishonest than the thieves they try. When I went to the nobles, they reviled me and set their dogs on me and had me driven off with whip so that my humiliation was very bitter and I ran through the streets of Thebes with a torn rope and with blood dripping from my legs. The merchants and judges saw my degradation and listened to my words no longer. They drove me away, saying, should you come to us again with false accusations, we will have you condemned as a slanderer and agitator. I returned then to my house, perceiving that all my labor was in vain, my death would have done no one any service. I sat once more beneath the sycamore in my garden and watched the silent fish in the pool and so found peace, while the donkeys brayed in the street and children played at war and cast dung on one another. Captor came to visit me, for at last he had ventured to return to Thebes. He arrived with pomp in a finely decorated chair carried by eighteen black slaves. He sat there on soft cushions, and costly salves trickled from his forehead to spare him the evil smells of the poor quarter. He had gotten considerably fatter, and a Syrian goldsmith had made him a new eye of gold and precious stones, of which he was exceedingly proud although it chafed the socket so badly that he took it out as soon as he had sat down beside me under the sycamore. First he embraced me and wept for joy at this meeting. His weight was mountainous as he laid his broad hands on my shoulders, and the seat mutey brought out broke to pieces under him. Having turned up the skirts of his garment, he sat on the ground. He told me the war in Syria was nearing its end and that Horam was just then besieging Kadesh. He boasted of the great business he himself had done in Syria and told me that he had bought an old palace in the wealthy quarter and hired hundreds of laborers to rebuild it that it might be worthy of his affluence. He said to me, I have heard evil of you in Thebes, my lord Sinew, where it is said that you have been stirring up the people against Horam and that judges and other eminent men are incensed against you because you have accused them of many injustices. I counsel you to be careful. Perhaps they will not dare to condemn you, because you are in favor with Horam, but they may come one dark night to kill you and burn your house if you continue with your talk and stir up the poor against the rich. Tell me what is the matter with you and what has set these ants running in your brain, that I may help you as a good servant should help his master. I bowed my head and told him all that I had fought and done. He listened to me and shook his head until his fat cheeks wobbled. When I finished, he said, I know that you are a mad, lonely man, my lord Sinew, but I thought your madness might have improved with the years. It seems to have grown worse, although with your own eyes you saw what happened in the name of Aten. I believe these whims attack you because of your idleness. It would be better if you would ply your trade again, for by healing one sick man you do more good than with all your talk, which only does harm to yourself and to all whom you lead astray. If you have no wish to continue in your profession, you can always pass your time in some useful occupation, like other wealthy men. 
you could collect jewelry and other objects fashioned during the period of the pyramids. In truth, sinew, there are many ways of passing the time and so keeping these vain fancies from your mind. Women and wine are in no way the worst means to this end. For Ammon's sake dice, waste your gold on women, drink yourself insensible, do anything. But do not hurl yourself to destruction with vain talk, for I love you dearly, my lord Sinew, and I desire no harm to come to you. He said also, nothing in the world is perfect. The crust of every loaf is burned, every fruit has its worm, and when a man has drunk wine, he must suffer next morning. For this reason there is no perfect justice, even good deeds have evil consequences, and the best motives may lead to death and defeat, as Agneton's example should have taught you. Look at me, my lord Sinew. I am content with my mean lot and grow fat in harmony with gods and men. Pharaoh's judges bow before me and the people praise my name, while the very dogs defile your garments. Take life quietly, it is not your fault that the world is as it is, that has ever been so and ever will. I contemplated his corpulence and his wealth and greatly envied him his peace of mind, but I said to him, be it as you say, captor. I will ply my trade once more. Tell me, is the name of Aten still remembered and still cursed? For you spoke his name although it is forbidden. Captor said, truly, Aten's name was as quickly forgotten as the pillars of Agneton were effaced. Yet I have seen artists draw in the manner of Aten, and there are storytellers who tell dangerous tales, one may see now and again the cross of Aten drawn in the sand and upon the walls of latrines, so it may be that Aten is not yet quite dead. Be it as you say. I will ply my trade, and as a recreation I will also start some collection as you have counseled me. As I have no desire to mimic others, I will collect all those who yet remember Aten. But Captor fancied that I spoke in jest, for he knew as well as I how much evil Aten had brought on Egypt and on myself. After this we talked agreeably of many things. Muti brought wine, and we drank together until slaves came and helped him to rise. Because of his great weight, he found difficulty in getting to his feet. He left me, but on the following day he sent me munificent presents, which secured for me such comfort and plenty that nothing would have been wanting to my happiness if I could have been happy. So I set up the physician's sign above my door and took up my work again, requiring gifts according to the means of my patients. But I required nothing of the poor, and sick people squatted in my courtyard from morning until night. I asked them very cautiously about Aten, being unwilling to frighten them or to give rise to evil report since my reputation in Thebes was already sufficiently black. But I found that Aten had been forgotten and that no one any longer understood him. Only agitators and those who had suffered injustice remembered him, and the cross of Aten was used as an evil symbol to do men harm. When the waters fell, E.I.E. the priest died. It was said that he had starved to death because his dread of poison would not allow him to eat. Then Horam brought the war in Syria to an end and allowed the Hittites to keep Kadesh since he could not win it back. He returned in triumph up the river to Thebes, where he celebrated all his victories. He observed no period of mourning after Eie's death but declared publicly that Eie had been a false pharaoh who through his ceaseless warfare and extortionate taxation had brought only suffering to Egypt. Having put an end to the war and closed the gates of Sekhmet's temple, he persuaded the people that he had never desired war but had been forced to obey the false pharaoh. Therefore, the people greatly rejoiced at his return. But as soon as Horam had arrived in Thebes, he sent for me and said, Sinew, my friend, I am older than when we parted, and my spirit has been sorely oppressed by your words, with which you accused me of being a bloodthirsty man who brought only harm to Egypt. I now have my desire and have re-established the might of Egypt so that no danger threatens the land, I have snapped the points of the Hittite spears and shall leave the conquest of Kadesh to my son Rameses. I have had my fill of war and mean to build a powerful kingdom for him. Egypt is as filthy as a poor man's stable, but soon you will see me heave out the dung, replace wrong by right, and give to every man his full measure. Truly, my friend Sinew, 
with my coming the old times return, and all shall be as it was. For this reason I intend to efface from the line of kings the miserable names of Lai and Tutankhamun, since Akhenaten's has already been removed, that it may seem as if their times had never been. I shall reckon my own reign from the night of great Pharaoh's death when I came to Theb's spear in hand with my falcon flying ahead. He leaned his head moodily in his hand. The war had carved lines in his face and there was no joy in his eyes as he said, the world is indeed different from what it was when we were boys, when the poor had their full measure and when even in the mud huts there was no lack of oil and fat. But Egypt shall be fruitful and wealthy again. I will send ships to punt, I will set work going once more in the quarries and deserted mines that I may build bigger temples and gather gold, silver, and copper for Pharaoh's treasury. In ten years you will not recognize Egypt, Sinew, for you shall then see no more beggars or cripples in the land. The weak shall give place to the strong, and I will wash away the sickly blood from Egypt and make of it a sturdy nation, which my son shall lead into battle for the conquest of the world. I did not rejoice at his words. My belly sank to my knees, and my heart was seized with a deadly chill. I did not smile, but stood before him dumb. This angered him, and scowling as of old, he said, You are as sour as ever, sinew. You are like a barren thornbush in my sight, and I do not know why I expected to feel such joy in meeting you again. I called you to me before ever I had lifted my sons in my arms or embraced my consort Bakitaman, for war and power have made me lonely. There was not one single man in Syria with whom I could share my sorrow and joy, and when I spoke I had always to weigh my words. From you, Sinew, I desire only friendship. Yet it appears as if your friendship has burned out and as if you felt no joy in my return. I bowed low before him and my lonely soul cried out to him. I said, Horam, of all the friends of our youth you are the only one now living. I shall always love you. Now the power is yours, and soon you will set upon your head the crowns of both kingdoms, and no one will be able to curb your power. I beg you, Horam, raise up Aten once more. For the sake of our friend Akhenaten, raise up Aten. For the sake of our most terrible crime raise up Aten, that all men may be our brothers and that there may be no more war. When Horam heard this he shook his head in pity and said, You are as mad as before, Sinew. Don't you see that Agneton threw a stone into the water with a great splash, but now I smoothed the surface as if he had never been. Don't you see that my falcon brought me to the golden house on the night of the great pharaoh's death so that Egypt might not fall? I bring back the old ways, for men are never satisfied with the present, in their eyes only the past is good, and the future. I will unite past and future. I will milk the wealthy of their abundance, I will milk the gods who have grown too fat. In my kingdom the rich will not be too rich nor the poor too poor, and neither god nor man will compete with me for power. Yet I talk to you in vain since you cannot comprehend my thought. Your own thoughts are those of a feeble man, and the weak have no right to live in the world but are made to be trampled underfoot by the strong. So is it also with nations, so it has ever been and ever will he. Thus we parted, Horam and I, and our friendship was diminished. When I left him, he went to his sons and lifted them in his strong arms. From his sons he went to Princess Bakitaman's room and said to her, my royal consort, you have shone in my thought like the moon during these past years, and my longing has been very great. Now my work is done, and you shall soon sit by my side as your sacred blood entitles you to do. I have shed much blood for your sake, Bakataman, and for your sake cities have burned. Have I not earned my reward? Bakataman sweetly smiled at him, and stroking his shoulder shyly, she said, Truly you have earned your reward, my consort Horam, great warrior of Egypt. I have built in my garden a pavilion the like of which has never been seen, to receive you as you deserve. Every stone in its walls I have collected myself in my great longing for you. Let us go to this pavilion, that you may have your reward in my arms and that I may give you joy. Horam exulted at her words, 
and Bakitaman led him into the garden. The members of the court hid and held their breath at what would follow. Slaves and stable boys fled also. Thus Bakitaman led Horam to the pavilion. When in his impatience he would have seized her, she defended herself gently and said, Bridle your manhood for a while, Horam, that I may tell you with what great toil I have built this pavilion. I hope you remember what I said when last you took me by force. Look carefully at these stones. Each one of them, and they are not few, is a memorial of my pleasure in another man's embrace. I have built this pavilion with my own pleasure, and in your honor, Horam. This great white stone was brought to me by a gutter of fish who was enchanted with me, this green one was given me by an emptier of latrines in the charcoal market, and these eight brown stones set together were brought by a vegetable seller who was quite insatiable and who warmly praised my accomplishments. Have patience, Horam, and I will tell you the history of every stone. We have plenty of time. Many years lie before us, but I believe the story of these stones will last me until my old age, if continued each time you seek my embrace. At first Horam would not believe her words, but took them for some grotesque joke, and Bakitaman's modest demeanor deceived him. When he looked into her oval eyes, he saw there a hatred more terrible than death, and he believed what she told him. Mad with rage he seized his Hittite knife to slay the woman who had so hideously dishon at him. She bared her breast to him and said mockingly, Strike, Horon! Strike the crowns from your head! For I am a priestess of Sekhmet, I am of the sacred blood, and if you kill me you will have no right to the throne of the pharaohs. Her words brought Horon to his senses. She held him bound, and her revenge was complete. He dared not tear down her pavilion, which confronted him whenever he looked out from his rooms. After reflection he saw no other course than to appear ignorant of Bakitaman's behavior. To tear the building down would have been to betray to everyone his knowledge that Bakitaman had let all Thebs spit upon his couch, and he preferred laughter behind his back to open shame. From then on he laid no hand on Bakitaman, but lived alone. To Bakitaman's credit be it said that she embarked on no more building works. Such was Horam's return and I fancy he had little joy of his majesty when the priests anointed him and set the red crown and the white on his head. He grew suspicious and trusted no one, believing that all derided him behind his back because of Bakitaman. Thus he always had a thorn in his flesh, and his heart knew no peace. He numbed his grief with work and began to clear the dung from Egypt, to restore the old ways and to put right in the place of wrong. In justice I must speak also of Horam's virtues, for the people praised his name and held him to be a good ruler. After only a few years of reign he was numbered among the great pharaohs of Egypt. He milked the rich and eminent, that none might compete with him for power, and this greatly pleased the people. He punished unjust judges and gave the poor their rights. He revised the taxes and paid the tax gatherers regularly from the royal treasury so that they could no longer enrich themselves by extortion from the people. He traveled incessantly from province to province, from village to village, seeking out abuses. His journeys could be traced by the cropped ears and bleeding noses of corrupt tax gatherers. The cracking of whips and cries of lamentation were heard far and wide from the places where he set up his courts. Even the poorest could approach him, and he dealt out incorruptible justice. He sent ships again to punt. Once more the wives and children of seamen wept on the quays and gashed their faces with stones as custom required, and Egypt prospered exceedingly. Of every ten ships that sailed, three returned every year laden with treasure. He built new temples also and rendered the gods their due favoring no one god save Horus and no one temple save that in Hetnitsut, where his own image was worshipped as a god, to whom the people made sacrifice of oxen. For all these things the people praised his name and told fabulous tales of him. Captor also prospered mightily until no other man in Egypt could vie with him in wealth. Having neither wife nor children, he had named Horam his heir, that he might live in peace for the remainder of his life and gather ever greater riches. 
For this reason Horam extorted less from him than from other wealthy men. Kapta invited me often to his house, which with its gardens formed a whole district in itself so that he had no neighbors to disturb his peace. He ate from golden dishes, and in his rooms water ran from silver taps in the Cretan manor. His bath was of silver, and the seat of his privy was of ebony, and the walls of this were inlaid with rare stones fitted together to form diverting pictures. He offered me strange foods, and wine from the pyramids. During his meals he was entertained by singers and players, while the fairest and most highly skilled dancing girls in Thebes performed marvels in their art for his enjoyment. He said to me, My Lord Sinew, when a man attains a certain wealth, he cannot become poor but grows even richer without lifting a finger to help himself, so strangely is the world ordered. My wealth originated with you, Sinew, so I shall ever acknowledge you as my Lord, and you shall lack nothing all the days of your life. For your own sake it is well that you are not rich, for you would never use your means to the best advantage but would so unrest and bring about great calamities. He also favored artists, sculptors hewed his image in stone, giving him a noble and distinguished appearance. They made his limbs slender, his hands and feet small, and his cheekbones high. In these sculptures both his eyes had their sight, and he sat plunged in thought with a scroll on his knee and a pen in his hand although he had never even tried to learn to read and write. His scribes alone read and wrote and totted up huge sums on his behalf. These statues greatly amused Captor, and the priests of Ammon, to whom he had given vast presents that he might live in amity with the gods, set up his image in the great temple, and he bore the cost of this himself. I was glad for Captor's sake that he was rich and happy. Indeed, I was glad of everyone's contentment and no longer sought to deprive men of their illusions if they were made happy thereby. Truth is often bitter, and it may sometimes he kinder to kill a man than to take his dreams from him. But no dreams cooled my own forehead, and my work brought me no peace although at this time I tended many sick people. Of the patients whose skulls I opened only three died so that my reputation as a skull surgeon stood high. But I lived in continual discontent and found fault with everyone. I nagged at Captor for his gluttony, at the poor for their sloth, at the rich for their selfishness, and at the judges for their indifference, and I was satisfied with none. Sick people and children I never chided, but healed my patients without giving them needless pain, and let Muti share out her honey cakes among the small boys in the street whose eyes reminded me of thoughts. Men said of me, this sinew is a wearisome, bitter man. His liver is swollen, and gall bubbles out of him in his speech so that he can find no delight in life. His evil deeds pursue him so that at night he finds no rest. Let us pay no heed to what he says, for his tongue stings himself more viciously than it stings others. It was true. Whenever I had poured forth my bitterness, I suffered for it and wept. I spoke malignantly of Horam also, and all his deeds were evil in my eyes. Most of all I spoke ill of his, scum whom he maintained out of Pharaoh's stores and who led an idle life in taverns and pleasure houses, boasting of their prowess and violating the daughters of the poor so that no woman could walk safely in the streets of Thebes. Horam forgave his ruffians all they did. When the poor turned to him with complaints about their daughter's plight, he told them that they should be proud because his men were begetting so sturdy a race. Horam was growing ever more suspicious by nature, and there came a day when his guards visited my house, drove away the sick from my courtyard, and brought me into his presence. Spring had come again, the river had fallen, and swallows were darting above the sluggish, muddy waters. Horam had aged. His head was bowed, and the muscles stood out like cords on his long, thin body. He looked me in the eye and said, Sinew, I have warned you many times, but you do not heed my warnings. You continue to tell the people that the warrior's profession is the most degraded and contemptible of all. You say that it would be better for children to die in their mother's wombs than to be born warriors. You say that two or three children are enough for any woman and that it is better for her to be happy with three children than unhappy and poor with nine or ten. You have said also that the god of the false pharaoh was greater than all other gods. 
You have said that no man should buy or sell another as a slave and that the people who plow and sow ought to possess the land they cultivate, though it be pharaohs or of gods. You have declared that my rule differs little from that of the Hittites. And you have said much that was even more outrageous. Any other man would have been sent to the quarries long ago. I have been patient with you, Sinew, because you were once my friend. As long as Eie the priest was alive, I had need of you because you were my only witness against him. Now I need you no longer, you may rather harm me through your knowledge. Had you been wise, you would have held your tongue, lived a quiet life, and been content with your lot, for truly you have lacked nothing. Instead, you bespatter me with slander, and that I will no longer endure. His wrath increased as he spoke, he slashed his thin legs with his whip, scowled, and went on, you have been a sand flea between my toes and a horse fly on my shoulder. I allow no barren trees that bear only poisonous thorns in my garden. I must banish you from Egypt, Sinew, and never again shall you see the land of Chem. If I allowed you to remain, the day would come when I should have to put you to death, and that I do not wish to do because you were once my friend. Your extravagant words might be the spark to kindle the dry reeds. When once dry reeds have caught, they blaze away to ashes. I will not allow the land of Chem to be gutted again, no, neither for gods nor for men. I banish you, Sinew, for you can be no true Egyptian, but some strange abortion of mixed blood. Sick notions throng your head. It may be that he was right and that my heart's torment arose from the mixture in my veins of Pharaoh's sacred blood and the pale, dying blood of Mitanni. Yet I could not but smile at his words, though I was half stunned by them, for Thebes was my city. I was born and brought up there and desired to live in no other place. My laughter enraged Horon. He had expected me to fall prostrate before him and implore his mercy. He cracked Pharaoh's whip and shouted, Be it so! I banish you from Egypt forever. When you die, your body shall not be brought home for burial though I may permit it to be preserved according to custom. It shall be buried by the shore of the Eastern Sea, from which ships put forth for the land of Punt, for that is to be your place of exile. I cannot send you to Syria, for Syria's embers are yet glowing and need no bellows. Nor can I send you to the land of Cush since you affirm that the color of a man's skin has no significance and that Egyptians and Negroes are of equal worth. You might instill foolish ideas into the black men's heads. But the land by the seashore is deserted. You are welcome to make your speeches to the black wind of the desert, and from those hills you may preach at your pleasure to jackals and crows and serpents. God shall measure out your domain, and if you stray outside these bounds, they shall slay you with their spears. Save for this you shall lack nothing. Your couch shall be soft and your food abundant, and any reasonable request shall be complied with. Truly loneliness is punishment enough, and because you were once my friend, I have no desire to oppress you further. I did not dread the loneliness since all my life I had been alone and was born to be so. My heart melted in sadness to think that never more should I behold Thebes or feel the soft soil of the black land beneath my feet or drink the water of the Nile. I said to Horam, I have few friends, for men shun me because of my bitterness and my sharp tongue, but you will surely allow me to take leave of them. I would gladly take my leave of Thebes also and walk once more along the avenue of Rams, to breathe the perfume of sacrificial smoke among the bright pillars of the great temple and to smell the fried fish at nightfall in the poor quarter of the city. Horam would assuredly have granted my request if I had wept and prostrated myself at his feet for he was a very vain man. But weakling though I was, I would not humble myself before him, for learning should not bow to power. I put my hand before my mouth and hid my fear in yawns, for I had ever been overcome by drowsiness when most afraid. In this I believe I differ from other men. Then Horam said, I shall permit no needless farewells since I am a warrior and dislike weakness. I will make your journey easy and send you immediately on your way without arousing public excitement or demonstrations. You are known in Thebes, better known than perhaps you are aware. 
You shall leave in a closed chair, but if anyone desires to accompany you to your place of banishment, I will permit it. Nevertheless, he must stay there all his days, even should you die first. He too must die there. Dangerous thoughts are pestilence readily transmitted from one to another, and I do not desire your sickness to return to Egypt with any other man. If by your friends you mean a certain mill slave whose fingers have grown together and a drunken artist who portrays a god squatting by the roadside, and a couple of negroes who have frequented your house, then you need not seek to take farewell of them, they have gene on a long journey and will never return. In that hour I hated Horam, but I hated myself more. Once again my hands had sown death, and my friends had suffered through me. I said nothing but stretched forth my hands at knee level and left him, and the guards took me away. Twice he opened his mouth to speak to me before I went, and he took a step forward. Then he stopped and said, Pharaoh has spoken. The guards shut me into a chair and carried me away from Thebes, past the three hills and eastward into the desert along a stone-paved road that had been built at Horam's command. We journeyed for twenty days until we came to the harbor where ships took aboard cargoes for the land of Punt. There were people living here, and so the guards carried me a three days journey from there, along the coast to a deserted village where fishermen had once dwelt. Here they measured out an area for my walking and built me a house in which I have lived all these years. I have lacked nothing. I have lived the life of a rich man. Here are writing materials and paper of the finest, caskets of black wood in which I keep the books I have written, and all the requirements of a physician. But the book I now write is the last, and I have no more to say for I am old and tired, and my eyes are so dim that I can scarcely distinguish the characters on the papyrus. I do not think I could have survived had I not recorded, and thus relived, my life. I have written to make clear to myself the reason for my existence, yet now that I bring my last book to an end I am more ignorant of it than when I began to write. Nevertheless, writing during these years has greatly comforted me. Every day the sea has been before my eyes. I have seen it red, I have seen it black. I have seen it green in the daytime and in the darkness white. On days of searing heat I have seen it blow than blue stones. It is enough, for the sea is vast and terrible for a man to have before his eyes forever. I have also beheld the red hills about me. I have examined sand fleas, scorpions and serpents have been my confidants, and they no longer shun me but listen when I speak. Yet I believe they are bad friends to man, and I have had as great a surfeit of them as of the endless, rolling billows of the sea. I should mention that in the course of my first year in this village of white and bones and tumble-down huts, when ships were sailing once more to punt, Muti came to me from Thebes with one of Pharaoh's caravans. She greeted me and wept bitterly at the sight of my wretchedness, for my cheeks had fallen in, my belly had shrunk, and my mind was steeped in indifference. She soon recovered and began to scold me, saying, Have I not warned you a thousand times, sinew? not to run your head into snares in your foolish man's way. Men are deafer than stones, they are little brats of boys who must always be cracking their heads against the wall. Truly you have run your head against the wall often enough, my lord sinew, and it is time you settled down and led the life of a wise man. But I rebuked her, saying that she ought never to have left Thebes, for she had now no hope of return. By her coming she had bound her life to the life of a banished man. In reply she railed at great length. On the contrary, what has happened to you is the best thing that has ever happened, and I believe that Horam has shown himself your true friend in bringing you to so peaceful a place in your old age. I too have had enough of the bustle of Thebes, and of those whining neighbors, who borrow cooking pots without returning them and empty their garbage into my court. When I come to think of it, the copper founder's house was never the same after the fire. The roasting pit burned the meat, and the oil turned rancid in the jars. There were drafts along the floors and the shutters rattled unceasingly. Now we may make a fresh start and build everything to our liking. I have already chosen an excellent place for the garden. I shall cultivate herbs and watercress, which you greatly enjoy, my lord. 
I shall give work enough to these lazy drones whom Pharaoh has set to protect you from robbers and evilders. They shall hunt fresh game for you every day, they shall catch fish and gather mussels and crabs on the shore, although I suspect that sea fish are not so good as those we had from the river. Moreover, I think of selecting a suitable burial place, if you will permit me, my lord. Having come so far, I never mean to leave here again. I have had enough of wandering from place to place in search of you, and journeys frighten me since never until now have I set foot outside Thebes. Thus did Muti comfort me and cheer me with her grumbling. I believe that it was thanks to her that I stretched forth my hand to life again and began to write. She goaded me to it although she could not read and secretly regarded my writing as nonsense. Yet she was glad for me to have some occupation, and she saw to it that I rested between times and enjoyed all the good dishes she prepared for me. She fulfilled her promise and set Pharaoh's guards to work, making their lives a burden to them so that they cursed her with great feeling behind her back and called her a witch and a crocodile. But they dared not oppose her, for then she reviled them volubly, and her tongue was sharper than an ox goad. I fancy that Muti's influence was most wholesome. She kept the men in continual activity so that their time passed quickly. She rewarded them by baking good bread for them and brewing strong beer in great jars. They had fresh green stuff from her herb garden, and she taught them how to vary their diet. Every year when the ship sailed to Punt, Captor sent us many donkey loads of goods from Thebes. He commissioned his scribes to write to us of all that went on in the city so that I did not live altogether in a sack. All this was of benefit to my guards. They learned new skill from Muti and grew rich from the presents I made them so that they did not long too sorely for Thebes. Now I am weary with writing, and my eyes ache. Muti's cats jump on my knee and rub their heads against my hand. My heart is weary of all I have written, and my limbs long for their eternal rest. Though I may not be happy, yet am I not unhappy in my loneliness. I bless my paper and my pen, for thanks to them I could become a little boy again in the house of my father Senmat. I have walked the roads of Babylon with Menea and Merit's lovely arms have been about my neck. I have wept with those who mourned and shared out my grain among the poor. But I will not remember my evil deeds or the bitterness of my loss. All this have I, Sinu the Egyptian, written, and for my own sake. Neither for gods nor for men, nor to immortalize my name, but only to bring peace to my own poor heart, whose measure is now full. I know that the guards will destroy all that I have written as soon as I am dead, and by the command of Horam they will pull down the walls of my house. Yet I do not know whether I greatly care. Nevertheless, I am carefully preserving these books I have written, and Muti has plaited a strong cover of palm fiber for each of them. I keep these covered books in a silver box, and the silver box lies within a casket of hard wood, and that again within a copper one just as the divine books of Thoth were once enclosed, to be sunk to the bed of the river. Whether my books will thus escape the guards, and whether Muti will hide them in my grave, I do not know, nor am I much concerned. For I, Sinew, am a human being. I have lived in everyone who existed before me and shall live in all who come after me. I shall live in human tears and laughter, in human sorrow and fear, in human goodness and wickedness, in justice and injustice, in weakness and strength. As a human being I shall live eternally in mankind. I desire no offerings at my tomb and no immortality for my name. This was written by Sinew, the Egyptian, who lived alone all the days of his life.